I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. Always so great to talk to my favorite astronaut, Mike Massimino. He has a new book called Moonshot. This guy has been through so much stuff. He is a case study on achieving your dreams. Again, his book is Moonshot, and he's an astronaut, so... Such an interesting conversation. Here's Mike. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. I appreciate so much you coming on the podcast again. I appreciate you having me back on. Just good to see you. Thank you. And great book. I really enjoyed it. This was different from your earlier book that we spoke about, which was more like autobiography. And this is more what you learned from all these different experiences. And there's a little bit yeah. of overlap, which I want to talk about. But, you know, this book, Moonshot, it's very interesting. The idea that, you know, it's almost like you personally have like leaned into the things that are most difficult and impossible. Like there was one story in the beginning that had a lot of impact on me, which was you talked about the guy who applied for the astronaut program and they said no, yeah. and he didn't want to apply again because he figured, ah, they'll just reject me. And right. you got accepted like on your fourth or fifth time applying and you went through all this stuff. So I wanted, it was interesting though, how like that almost inspired you, the fact that that guy wasn't going to apply again and explain that. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you, uh, you you bringing up that story. And, and uh, that what it, what it was is that I had been rejected. At this point, it was my third time. I was medically disqualified on top of it. The th when I my, so I got rejected outright twice, and then my third time I got an interview. But then I was uh, medically disqualified through the revi a vision issue that I was trying to clear up because I didn't want to give up. And um, at the time, it didn't seem hopeful. I took a job at Georgia Tech after that third rejection. I was still going to keep trying, but moved to Atlanta, and there was a guy at Georgia Tech when I arrived, a young, another young professor there who had interviewed and did not get accepted, and I, I, I reached out to him. He invited me over for a barbecue and, um, with my family, and I asked him during that afternoon uh, that we were together, are you think you're going to try again? And he, he just looked at me and said, no, I, I don't think I am, and I was shocked because this guy had it all together, man. He was really smart. He was able to talk to me, flip burgers, and, and supervise his kids at the same time. So he was a multitasker, James. I thought this guy was really good. And, and I was like, wow, they're not going to pick him. If they don't pick him, they're never going to pick me is my my reaction to all that was getting to know him. 
And then when he said, you know, he's not going to apply again, and I said, why not? And he, he said, as you said, well, they just they turned me down before. I just figured they'll turn me down again. And, and I hate to, to tell you, James, I gave him no encouragement. I know usually I would say, ah, oh, you can do it. But I just, I was like, oh, and I just didn't say one thing or another. And it just like kind of shook me that someone would give up that dream. But I, I, I think what it, I hope what it showed to in his case was that maybe it's not for everybody. And, and I'm sure he had a great career uh, as a, as a professor, but from my perspective, I, I couldn't imagine trying once getting told no and, and giving up. Um, I, yeah, well, I, so. I wonder if that suggests that there's almost two types of success. There's, kind of the the normal path where if you like get good grades in college get uh, do a good phd thesis mm -hmm. get published in a lot of places mm -hmm. then you'll get a, a good job as an academic yeah you raise fund for your projects you know money for your projects and stuff so now you get tenure and that's like kind of i don't want to say a normal path because there's there's you could be a lawyer also mm -hmm. or a doctor yeah. or whatever yeah. but but that there's like a formula where if you kind of just check these boxes you're going to do well and then the other type of success is okay i want to be an astronaut which the first reaction everyone's going to have is you're insane and <laughs> and then you say no no and i'm afraid of heights and my yeah. eyes are bad yeah now you're really insane yeah and then you just you just push it which means yeah. you do everything you did like you get to know all the people you move to the neighborhood where all the astronauts live you you do all these weird exercises to improve your vision for the vision test like and then you know somehow or other there must be math to this like the odds eventually flip to your side yeah and i i think there's a lot of truth to that um where you know and then the first the first chapter in the book when i talk about this is it's one in a million is not zero and that you you, you know you're you're up against it it's it's very unlikely but it's interesting the way you put it there james is that as you continue to do things uh, to hopefully improve your chances to get closer to that goal, the odds start to tip in your favor or at least get better. So I think that's that's definitely true. And the odds also get better when other people drop out, <laughs> like in the case of that other guy. So, um, right. yeah, but it's it's just, I, I think it's it's having, um, in, in my case, having a, a passion for something that totally overmatched anything else that I was interested in. It was the, the space program to me for, as a from as a little kid uh, was what I was interested in. And it still remains that for whatever reason, whether it was what I, you know, was watching Neil Armstrong on the moon at age six, whatever happened to me happened to me. And it was, it was there in my heart and my soul and I couldn't give it up. And so the thought of not at least trying, and I, I went in with, with full, uh, knowledge that this was nearly impossible and probably was not going to work out. And it was a bit of a, a miracle that it did, but you give yourself a chance by trying and not giving up and doing what you can to try to improve your chances and keeping that goal in mind, fully realizing that it may not ever happen. But I, I felt like I would be okay if it never happened as long as I kept trying. Um, well, but if I didn't try, if I didn't just keep trying and I gave up, then I, I don't think I would be happy with myself. Well, how, how I mean, this le leads to a bunch of questions, but how much more, let's say that last time mm -hmm. when you did get accepted, let's say you had failed. So let yep. me get, let me even make it more specific. You had to take the eye exam twice because yeah. it was three weeks apart. And so they yep. just, by whatever rule they, yep. they needed to do it twice. You passed the first time and then you passed the second time. Yep. But let's say you did not pass the second time. It was that close that you just, between the yes and the no of you becoming right. in the astronaut program, would you have tried again? Oh yeah. There's no doubt in my mind. I mean, I would have just kept trying um, I, I felt like, and as it turned out, I was kind of on the young side. You know, I was, I was 33 when I showed up for work, almost 34. And the average age of, uh, at the time of selection for astronauts is typically late thirties or so. So I probably had a couple more selections where I would have been competitive. As you get older, you, you're not, uh, you're not ever ruled out for age. It just gets, you know, as you get older, it, it, it seems less likely maybe, but not, not because of your age, but you know, your health and so on things, they start finding things, I think, but, but no, there's no doubt in my mind. I keep, I would keep trying to this day. I would never have not tried. So, you know, I wonder part of it is, so the very first time you tried, you mm -hmm. knew what the odds were. It's one in a million, yep. but let's fast forward to when you got accepted mm -hmm. at that point. I mean, I lost count of the number of people 
who are astronauts or involved mm-hmm. in the space program who are, who were who were saying to you, "Don't worry, Mike. You know you got it." And mm-hmm. like they were encouraging you. Yeah. But what was interesting to me is not that they were encouraging you, is that you even knew them. Yeah. So when you first <laughs> applied, you didn't know yeah. anybody, of course. No. But now, right. but you were like almost like part of the community. Yeah. Part, you, they they were your buddies. So that increases the odds a lot. And and what it makes me think is that the act of applying increases your chances because you have to become a better person. You you yourself have to improve. It's not the same person each time was applying. Mm-hmm. You yourself had to improve, yep. not just physically with the eyesight, but your mentality, your knowledge. You got a PhD in between mm-hmm. failures of applying. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you 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 became a better person in every way to in order to not necessarily improve your chances directly, but mm-hmm. just the process of applying over and over again forced you to become a better version of yourself. This is good, James. I wish I knew you back then. You'd have been very <laughs> encouraging. But you're you're right. I mean, uh, I, I kind of looked at what I had. I took more or less stock of what I had after college, and I was working when I decided I wanted to try to do this. And I realized, for example, an advanced degree was going to be necessary for me. I was a civilian. I wasn't going to join the military. I, I, you know, I have so much respect for all of my colleagues and all the people serving in the military, but I just didn't feel like that was the right way for me to go. I took the academic route and, and the engineering route and thought for that I needed at least an advanced degree, a master's, and, and most likely a PhD. So I, I pursued that, and that made me a better candidate. And then I thought in my case, I thought going to the Johnson Space Center is something I wanted to do anyway. I wanted to work in the space program down there where Mission Control Center is, where the astronauts are, where they train. I wanted to be a part of that firsthand. Even if that, you know, I was only there for three years and I went to Georgia Tech is the way it turned out. So for me, it was I wanted to get that experience after grad school down there anyway. And it also gave me the opportunity to meet people. So I got to meet them around in my neighborhood you know, I, I met Kevin Kriegel going to the local church, and he was – actually, I met him first giving a talk at, a, at University of Houston. He was taking a class. Kevin was a, an astronaut who was very encouraging to me. I got to meet him. He was having to be from Long Island. And serendipity takes place here. Once you put yourself out there and you get in that area, you know, where – at MIT even, I, you know, there was so many people that wanted to be an astronaut up there. Two guys from my lab, which was a small lab. We only had about eight or nine guy, people in the lab at any one time. But two of my, my lab mates also became astronauts. Um, my friend Greg Shamatov was a very good friend of mine at MIT. I just saw him last weekend. We were up, we were up at a uh, – our kids go to the same college, which is amazing. <laughs> so I saw him there, reconnected with him, and, and he was also my, you know, my friend. So you kind of go to these places where it's not wacky anymore. If I would have stayed in New York kind of working at IBM where I was, there was no one else that I knew trying to be an astronaut there. But up at MIT, there were a lot of people wanting to be astronauts. And then when I got to Houston, there were astronauts there. And I felt like that experience was going to help me. And let me let me go a little further, maybe, when I really think about it. Sure. What I felt like was that if they got to know me, they would like me. <laughs> and I, you know, just because I felt, and, and what I found interesting is because I had such a passion for the space program. And what I found interesting is that the more of the astronauts that I met, the more flight directors or people involved with the space program, I really liked these people. And I really felt like I fit in with them. And uh, I understood what their job was. It was more than just flying in space. It was, it was the engineering part of it. It was the long hours. It was helping other people fly in space. It was most of the, You only spend a few days really in space. Even if they're for you know, NASA for a very long time and you have long duration flights, like my friend Peggy Whitson has over 650 days in space. She's the American record holder. But she was there for 20 years. So, you know, that's the, most of your time is going to be spent on the ground helping others go to space and you need that passion. And, and I think getting to know these folks made me feel like I could be, I could be part of this. I, I fit in well. I think the concept of teamwork and taking care of each other and just their personalities, they were fun people. They were kind of, they were good people. And I, I wanted to be like them. And I felt like in my best days I was, and if they got to know me, that they might feel the same way, and and they did, and so I, I felt like for me it was a smart move to try to get, to meet them and and get to know as many as I could, and uh and to, that would that would help me. That's what I that's what I felt, and but do it in a way not like you you know trying to trying to force yourself to become friends with people, but do it on a professional level, working with them, and then they get to know you, and and they're like, yeah, we're very they were very supportive, so. I don't think I realized all this at the time, James. You're bringing this is great, man. You're bringing this all out. You're awesome. Well, I actually 
refer to your story often when I'm giving talks. Good. Where, <laughs> because like there's one thing you mentioned, well, you know, you just mentioned mm -hmm. it and, and you talk about this story in, in your first book mm -hmm. where these two members in your class and at MIT mm -hmm. also became astronauts. Yeah. But we also know it's a one in a million chance to become yeah. an astronaut. So, so it's a perfect example yeah. of the cliche of, oh, you're the average of the five people you spend your time with. So yeah, I yeah. always say in a talk, if, if Mike spent all of his time in a bar, probably <laughs> there would be no one who would be an astronaut who, yeah. from, from hanging out in a bar. Yeah. But you were spending your time in this MIT class on yep. robotics in Mars and you know, three people from the class became astronauts. Yeah, that's three people from my lab. And, and that was the way, you're absolutely right, James. And I think it's like, if you, you wanna surround yourself with a community of like-minded people, maybe, is that a good way of saying it, maybe? Of, yeah. Of people, and like, if you wanna be a, uh, an actor, uh, maybe you go to Hollywood or you go to Broadway and you hang around with other struggling actors and you figure out uh, how do we do this and you, you exchange ideas. And MIT was like, was if you want to, it's like going to Hollywood to be an actor. You go there not to be an actor. You go there to be an astronaut or to be a scientist or a Nobel Prize winner or whatever you have in mind. That's a good place to go, as are many other schools. MIT is not the only one. It was, happened to be the place where I was fortunate enough to get into. But it was not a nutty idea to become an astronaut. There's a lot of people that became astronauts that went to MIT. Even a lot of military people went to grad school at MIT. There was one guy there named Richard Batten. Dick Batten taught astrodynamics when I was there at MIT. This guy, there were 12 people walked in the moon. He had five of the moonwalkers in his class, okay? That's funny. Five moonwalkers, including Buzz Aldrin and Dave Scott, Charlie Duke. All these guys were in his class. Five of the 12 guys that walked on the moon took his class at MIT. So not to say that that is the, I don't know if that's the best place, but it was certainly a good place for me to go um, to not only get an education, but to be part of that, that community. And I, there were people, you know, there were astronauts coming to visit there that I met, uh, along the way and people who went on to become astronauts from MIT. And I happened to end up getting into that category too. So yeah, what you're saying, I, you know, that's really good. <laughs> so, but, you know, surround yourself, <laughs> surround yourself Feel with a community of like-minded people. And that was very helpful for me. Yep. But it's not just like-minded because mm -hmm. you're all working on yourself like and there's a lot mm -hmm. of stories in this book about people who even when they're like nine tenths or 99 percent of the way there they still needed to like almost keep carving their faults and traits mm -hmm. to not perfection but for excellence Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts, our untuck shirts. I love untuck, I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model and let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions 
and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like, I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. So you mentioned the guy, you actually you don't mention this person's name, but someone who already was an astronaut, I guess, mm-hmm. who had was flying a, a plane yep. and skidded off the runway but didn't tell anybody. Right. And they found out the next day because they could see the rocks mm-hmm. and the tracks and stuff. And he was and because he didn't tell anybody, he never went in space again. That's I guess it. he was a little embarrassed about it. Like what 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 happened? The point of all that in this in this particular case, and this you know, I don't mention the guy's name. It was more like a uh, it happened, but it was kind of a cautionary tale of what not mm-hmm. to do. And we had a culture there at NASA where if you make a mistake and you had what we call a close call, close calls could happen where, oh man, this happened and I lived through it. Uh, let me l- let me share that so the next person who encounters this problem can learn from it. And there was no, there was no shame in doing that, in, in admitting that we had all kind. I, I mentioned there was one case where an, an astronaut was ended up t- getting a little, a little hasty with, with uh, uh, lifting the gear on a touch and go, and it's, the plane settled back down to the runway. He in, in, hit, hit the runway at high speed with the airplane wrestled and under control and able to take off. And he came with a full confession and was totally forgiven. Uh, the because and he was a very respected person. We had our, our head of flight operations one time, uh, one of our very experienced pilots took out a landing light on a runway, coming in a little bit too low on a runway. And like, if this could happen to this guy, you know, let's, you, you hear these, you hear these lessons and you take them in and, you know, the forgiveness is there because it can happen to anybody. You know, you, things happen. And, uh, in this one particular case, so it wasn't reported where he ran off the runway and then he put the next pilot who flew that airplane at risk by not telling people that, you know, they would have done a full gear inspection. Right. Because there could be many reasons why it could have been personal fault or it could have been the equipment. We don't know. Yeah. But things happen. I mean, you know, whatever it was, I think it was at nighttime and there was, you know, sometimes a taxiway looks like a runway and a runway looks like a taxiway and the, you know, who knows what the, what the conditions were, but it doesn't mean that it's, you know, something, something that to be ashamed of it, you might be embarrassed, but, you got to come clean with what happened. You might get a new nickname out of it, but the worst thing you could do is hide it and then put someone else at risk. And then you were considered to be a person that, that couldn't be trusted. And so the, what one part of our culture was, is that when you make a mistake, uh, as embarrassing as it is, you need to tell people about it, especially when you can put someone else in, in jeopardy. Why do you think he didn't learn from the culture about this? I mean, he probably did learn it, but maybe in this one case, just whatever he, he didn't, he didn't feel comfortable reporting it for some reason. 
I, I don't know. I can't get in the guy's head. I don't know. And I never talked about it to him, right? But I think what it is, and I don't know, I would, this is what my, my thinking is, is that when, you, when you're thinking about others, uh, when you're thinking about the team, um, it's a bit different than thinking about your own butt, right? So, and I'm not saying this is what this guy did, but I, I always felt like when, when I made a mistake, my mistake might be bad enough that, you know, they'll say you're not meant to be an astronaut. But what I, what I tried to think of at that point, when I, when I encountered something that didn't work or some mistake I made, that it was important for me for the sake of the team to come forward with it, because maybe what happened to me can happen to somebody else. And if they learn about it, it won't happen to them. And therefore the team is better off. If you're only worried about yourself and your own rear end, then you're going to say, ah, you know, I'm not going to say because I don't want to look bad. But if you think of it as that we're on a mission together and we're, uh, we're trying to help each other and people can learn from my mistakes and the overall group is going to be better off learning from my mistake and safer. I mean, in this case where, you know, you did something not only that's embarrassing, but, but something that could put someone else at risk, you know, you, you have to come forward no matter how painful it is and how embarrassing it is. And people are going to respect you for it. That was the thing that I, that the culture we had is that you, when you came forward like that, they, you know, that's not an easy thing to admit, you know, when, when something bad happens or something, you do something dumb, but, uh, it happens. And when you come forward with, it usually leads to people saying, okay, you know, that, that took some guts to do that. Thank you. So it seems like almost there are two, maybe three benefits of this policy of encouraging people to, to come forward. Mm -hmm. One is the very first level thing, which is, okay, if there's a problem with the equipment, say something so we can check it out and maybe you're saving a life. Mm -hmm. The other thing, which is a little bit more subtle is that it makes you personally comfortable with admitting your faults. So take, taking that idea when you were fixing the Hubble telescope and something went wrong rather than right there in space in the middle of fixing the Hubble telescope, you would, you would, instead of just berating yourself and being embarrassed because the entire planet's looking at you, mm -hmm. you know, making a fool of yourself at the Hubble telescope, you're able to get right into, you know, mode, something went yep. wrong. Now it's time to fix it. So maybe that process itself of not being ashamed mm -hmm. allowed you to move forward very quickly yes. um, when something really was critical. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, in that case for me, James, when, when I, you, you're bringing me back to those moments when I made this mistake on the Hubble, I stripped the bolt and, and, uh, it put the, the repair of this science instrument at risk. And this instrument was able to analyze the atmospheres of far off planets. And we were trying to be, bring it back to life. It was a very complicated spacewalk. And, and I go and make this bonehead move during the spacewalk of stripping this screw. I, I remember thinking that this was a, this was a, a you know, a bad mistake. But the the Hubble and the science that they that could come from it was so much more important than my feelings. I mean, it wasn't that I was putting myself at you know oh, I'm going to sacrifice my life or get hurt for this. It was just you know I might my ego would take a shot maybe, um, and uh, but you know it was that goal of of the telescope of fixing the telescope was much more important than anything uh, that was going on in my head. And uh, I remember even thinking like stuff I had to do was a little sporty to you know, had climb, you know, go into different areas of the space shuttle that I wasn't used to translating in and was going to be a little on now because I'd gotten myself into this issue. I had to go to toolboxes and other places that were kind of hidden away in different places of not hidden, but in unusual places that I wasn't used to going to. And I was like, I don't know about this. And I was like, that doesn't matter. You know, my, my hesitancy right now, anything that's in my head is not as important as getting the job done today. And, uh, Whatever, whatever, you know, I had to, I had to keep that in mind. And when you have that in mind and when the mission, the team is more important than your own personal feelings, uh, I, I think that that's, that's good. That's, that's the organization you want to be a part of. Well, well, and you have a, a great kind of, uh, rule you call the 30 second rule for, for yeah. dealing with these kind of moments. Like I think everybody, like I know myself, mm -hmm. if something goes wrong in my life, I tend to berate myself and, mm -hmm. and negative self-talk is a very easy habit to fall into. And on the one hand, you can take an extreme, never have negative self-talk. But I, I think with your 30 second rule, which you can describe, it kind of allows for some, and then you move on. Right. 
Yeah, no, it's it, it was learned, uh, taught to me by my friend and crewmate, Megan MacArthur, who learned it from C.J. Sturkow, and I immediately... I spoke to him about about what he what what his interpretation of his of his own advice was, and so the thirty second rule is when you make a mistake, uh, it's okay to be mad and disappointed and you know irritated with yourself, but you you got to cap it. So give yourself thirty seconds of regret. Uh, CJ used to say thirty seconds of remorse, where you feel bad. Uh, you can berate yourself, call yourself every name in the book. Just, you know, don't, don't vocalize this because you'll scare people if you, you know, they hear you cursing yourself out, but give yourself that 30 seconds, set a mental timer for 30 seconds and, and be remorseful, be, be disappointed, be, be regretful, but then it's got to end and you have to let that mistake pass. And we used to say, um, in the astronaut office is that you're going to make mistakes, let them pass. But I, I like this 30 second of regret better because it gives me a chance to beat myself up. It just caps it at 30 seconds. And then I can move on. And uh, that you have to do because your team needs you. You can't wallow in the misery while you're trying to accomplish something when you when you make a mistake. It's okay to be mad. It's okay to be disappointed with yourself. 30 seconds and then move on. And, you know, it's interesting how here you were at some point achieving goal after goal for yourself. Like get in the space program, become an astronaut, go into space, go on a spacewalk. You know, and you're achieving all of these these goals. And this is after achieving like a PhD, which is normally like a big life goal for, for people. And there's a story in the book that reminds me that kind of this, this process of improvement and excellence never ends. And it's the conversation between Alan Bean and Pete Conrad that you mm -hmm. describe. And yeah. I just thought that was a great conversation because it, it shows how you're not at the end goal just because you got in the space program. Like Alan Bean had to, he had to step up and keep improving. And that's, Mm -hmm. In part because of this conversation, he was the last person in his class to go into space. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was interesting. Yeah, I think it was a reminder that, uh, and I sometimes speak about this in my in the the talks that I give that the 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 you mentioned all the goals, the PhD, becoming an astronaut, blah blah blah, all that stuff. But all that stuff took perseverance. Let's say you know, finishing the PhD and becoming a, an astronaut. That was those are two big things, right? Getting picked. And when I remember when I showed up at work, all of us had a, had a path to get there that was filled with uh, obstacles and hard work and good fortune too at times, you know, things working out, but you still hadn't done anything. And when you get that, that position, when you reach that goal, now you're in a position, I think, to put it to good use. And if all of a sudden you change your attitude about things and say, all right, you know, I'm an astronaut now, I don't need to work hard anymore. And you know, let all the, let all the accolades come, you know, that's the kiss of death. As soon as you feel, um, entitled to anything, uh, or you lose your, your passion or your willingness to sacrifice all the things that got you to that great position, that is what's going to be required to be successful moving forward. And as mad as I was at myself for messing up on that spacewalk, when I look back at it now, uh, you know, it all turned out okay. You know, the ground came through and we were able to fix the instrument, you know, working together, they came up with a solution. But it, it, what what helped me through that was not that I was the best spacewalker or engineer, but that I wasn't going to give that up. Just like I wasn't going to give up my dream to become an astronaut or my PhD when I failed my qualifier or any of these other things that happened, I wasn't about to give up on that spacewalk. It was just unthinkable. And so I think that that's a characteristic that can be very, very helpful. And I think once you slip into the to the thought that I don't have to work that hard or, you know, this is easy now or that's where I think you got to question your your thought process and maybe rethink what you're doing because that's, that's where I think you're susceptible to not doing a good job and not being successful. So it's interesting then because do you ever think or did you ever think when – so you left the space program in 2014 and you had a path for yourself like you became a Columbia professor. You've we're, We'll talk about some of these other things in, the, in a little bit. But mm – -hmm. Did you ever think, okay, well, my, the best part of my life is done. The peak performance of my career and, and life, my lifespan on this planet is, is over. Yes. <laughs> no, I think it was, you know, I remember hearing Michael Collins, the Apollo uh, 11 command module pilot. And I remember he was saying, not, not that your life is over, but he said a very, I've heard him say it a few times, um, that he realized that the most interesting job he was ever going to have in his life 
he had when he was in his 30s, you know, when he, when he went to the moon, right? I think he was probably, in it, I don't know how old he was when he went to the moon. Neil Armstrong, I know, was 38. So he's Mike, Michael was probably, Mike was probably around that age. He's gone now, unfortunately, passed a couple of years ago. But a uh, great guy, one of my childhood idols who I got to meet. Just a wonderful guy, very humble. And I remember him saying that. Before I was an astronaut, I, I first heard him say it. And I, I think that that's, that's okay. If you can have a job like an astronaut, like being, and I talk about that in the book too, like, it, it sort of defines you in, in certain ways that this was a wonderful job and it may not, I may not be able to top it, but I think that that's okay. But now being 10 years away from and so I did think that, you know, I'll never match this and so on. But what I did find uh, in my years, it's been now nine years since I left NASA, uh, nearly 10 now. Um, I, I felt like I, I, I feel now that I kind of had, have found something with my teaching and the writing of the book and speaking and television appearances and other things that still allows me to be part of the space program. And I find it very fulfilling. And in some ways it's a lot less stressful (laughs) and and it's, you know, it's not as dangerous, hopefully James. So there are, you know, there are some advantages to it, but I think that it's when you have a great job, like I had, um, I mean, we're talking about stuff I learned back in my astronaut days and, I remember meeting Charlie Duke, who was one of the moonwalkers, one of the 12 that walked on the moon. And he, we, he and I have become friends. And he came up to Columbia to speak to my students. And I spent a couple of days with him. It was great. And as we're walking around campus, you know, I realized that every conversation everyone was having with him and every talk he gave was about a couple of days he spent on the moon in his life. The man's in his 80s. So I said, you know, Charlie, everything you talk about is, does every, you know, you ever wonder about that? And he goes, no, that's okay, Mike. You know, that's, that's how significant those days were that they're not only days that you live in the moment, but that you can kind of relive and you take that experience with you and you share it. And so in some ways that might be even a a bigger contribution than actually doing that, that task. So yeah, I did have to, particularly when I first left, I think you, you know, when you, I think when you go through any major decision in life, like my decision to leave NASA, there's always going to be a little bit of regret. And you, you know, like you can't, I don't think you can make a major decision in life without, Oh, you know, I went this way. What happens if I went that way? And I kind of felt that way about it. I think pretty soon after I left NASA and was adjusting to my new life, um, I think those thoughts, those thoughts did go through my mind. Like, oh man, I'll never be able to match that. But now being this far away from it, uh, I'm really happy with what I'm doing. So I think that that's something to keep in mind too, is that everything has a phase in life. Alan Bean, who is one of my mentors, we've mentioned him already a couple of times. He gave me, I I think, very good advice at different times in my life. And and one of her was is look at life as a series of phases and you go from one phase to the next. And it doesn't mean that one is necessarily better or worse. They're just different and they're all good. And he went on in his career after being a moonwalker and then being in, on Skylab for a long duration flight, he went on to dedicate his life to painting and he became a very successful oh, yeah. artist. Uh, so I, I looked at it that way, that it's a, when you have a great career, be thankful for it. You know, don't say, you could always say, oh, I could have done more. I should have stayed there longer. Maybe I could have done this or that. But I think just be really grateful for that phase. And when it's time to move on, recognize it and move on to that next phase and embrace it. And what you, what you did will always be with you. It can always be a part of that next phase if it was that significant. And I feel like that's the way it was in my case. And, and you know, also, like you mentioned earlier, as you age, there's physical limitations to being an astronaut and doing some of the things you did. Yeah. So you lose some things, but you gain some things. Like you have the experience of doing what you did. So now you're taking that experience and either writing books or mm-hmm. teaching or perhaps mentoring future astronauts yeah. or, you know, these are, it's it's valuable to take the skills you've a- accumulated from that exciting yeah. career. There's this book from Strength to Strength, which talks about this a little bit by Arthur Brooks, mm-hmm. where you can't always be an athlete. Yeah. Sometimes you have to coach athletes. Yep. as you get older. So, and it, it, it's interesting. A lot of the people you describe, like, like Charlie Duke and Allie, Alan Beam here did that as well. Like mm-hmm. sort of took on these more teaching or mentoring kind of roles or, or artistic sort of roles based on their experience. This is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then 
suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth. I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I had come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We wanna care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious, like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're gonna give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best, from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck, on cooking, Dan Brown on writing, or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov. You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. There was a conversation I had again when I was a student in grad school. It was with a... A guy at NASA headquarters is very, very experienced. I can't remember exactly who it was, but he told me, I was talking about being an astronaut. He said, you know, being an astronaut isn't necessarily an end. It's a means to an end. 
that it gives you an opportunity to do great things with. And that's really what the job, I mean, the job is great while you're doing it, but it gives you such great experience and being again in the, you know, from writing the book, for example, is based on all the stuff I learned from NASA, all these things about teamwork and leadership and not giving up and pursuing goals and, and reaching out when you need help and so on. These were things that I learned as an astronaut. And so it wasn't just the job itself that was fulfilling and exciting and, and a very special time in my life. Uh, it was also lessons learned and experiences that will hopefully help other people. I think we don't always think of that. Uh, when we, we get to do, we get to do something really cool in life. That's great. Now, what are you going to do with that opportunity that you were given? And, uh, it can manifest itself in different ways. It doesn't always end well. <laughs> you know, I look, when I was leaving the when I was leaving the astronaut office, I looked at a lot of examples of people who left the astronaut office, and it doesn't always go well. But it does oftentimes go really well, where people are able to have a, a next career that is very exciting. And we can think of examples of people that went from career to career to career that we know that we've heard of uh, that you can say, "Wow, that's pretty cool." He went from this to this to this, and uh, I think that's okay. You know, it's all right to go to that next phase and realize that it may not be as exciting. Maybe you might not think it is, but it could be just as good. And that experience that you had that was so meaningful is what set you up for that next phase. Well, what's an example mm -hmm. where it didn't go so well for someone? And some examples I got from, especially some of the older guys, you know, they would say that, uh, you know, there were certain examples of an astronaut who left NASA and felt entitled where, you know, hey, I've done this or that, and now the goodies should come my way. And uh, they wouldn't ever be happy because they felt no matter what they got, what didn't live up to what they sacrificed as an astronaut. Jim Lovell gave me a piece of advice. That advice uh, came from Alan uh, Bean about never feeling entitled. That was, he said, whatever you do, Mike, never feel like anybody owes you anything for what you did. You know, people think I was an astronaut, I did this or that, and I, now I deserve stuff. No, 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 no. That's not going to work. Can't do that. Uh, Jim Lovell, we were at a uh, at an opening for the Apollo 13 movie in IMAX. Uh, it had come out a few years earlier, the, the Apollo 13 movie did, and then a few years later it was being released in IMAX, and I was at the premiere with him, and people were taking our pictures, and he goes, you know, Mike, I, I got one piece of advice for you. I'm like, what is that, Jim? And he said, see all these people with these cameras right here taking our picture? They're not going to care about us tomorrow. They're going to be taking pictures of somebody else. You got to remember that fame is fleeting. And, and he said there were some, you know, there's some people that he had worked with that didn't understand that, that fame was fleeting. And they were, they were never happy because of that. And mm -hmm. so I think that that's something to, to stay away from, of, of feeling entitled after you've done something really great or you think is great <laughs> or, or feeling that, you know, you're, you're going to be famous always because of it that you're always going to be invited to the white house, you know, or you're always going to be on your show, James, or whatever it might be. You know, that's not always going to happen. Well, you're always you know, welcome. Thank you're you, always thank welcome you. on the well, show. I appreciate that James, but yeah, <laughs> but you know, that's not, they may not always be the case and that's, that's okay. And, uh, if you think that, that you should be always, uh, always, always famous or always, uh, entitled to things, you're, you're done. And, uh, so well, that, that's not, that's not good. And then also some, some people, they kind of, they didn't do well when they left, they were not happy. They, things happen in their lives and you're like, how the heck did this happen? So. I mean, I, I look at what you gained in your career and what's told in this book, for instance, it's not like this external validation. Oh, I've been in space. I'm an astronaut, but you learned that, a, a moon shots are worth going for, you know, Absolutely. one in a million chance, like, like you you know, you describe, you know, you've been on the big bang theory a bunch of times, the TV show, mm -hmm. and then you and others are, have been writing a pilot or a script mm -hmm. for a TV idea. And they, it didn't, they didn't like it. And, and you learn the odds. It's basically one in a million to get a TV show or <laughs> one in a thousand to get a TV show on air. Even if you have a great idea, I've been through that experience several times myself mm -hmm. and you really have to just keep pursuing mm -hmm. to get, to make the math start to work for you and, and to give yourself better odds. And, you know, I, at least in, in the book, you're still trying, I don't know where it's ended up, but, you know, I'm sure you wrote that over a year ago, but, um, what's, what show were you trying to pitch? Well, that was, uh, a show after the big bang theory, uh, appearances. And when the big bang theory was winding down, 
uh, Bill Prady, one of the, the co-creator of the Big Bang Theory with Chuck Lorre, uh, he and I had become friends, and it was actually his agent's idea. His agent had said that when he would get together with Bill, I would he would hear all these stories that I would tell Bill, and Bill would relate them to you know just to amuse his agent. And his agent's like, you know, I think there may be a show there, and uh, you and Bill could. And he had he thought you know we could we could uh, help create this thing together along with a writer from The Simpsons named Dan Greeny and a, a director uh, Jamie Widows who directs a lot of TV shows. He actually played uh, in the movie uh, Animal House. He was the president of Animal House when he was a, a young, <laughs> when he was a kid, he was the actor. Like, you know, in his 20s, he was an actor. And anyway, so it was a pretty good team. And we got together and uh, and wrote a, you know, wrote a pilot. We ended up getting a pilot deal from one of the major networks. We had meetings with all the networks and, and one in particular loved it. And we, we said, oh, so we're going to write this pilot. And we did it and they passed on the pilot. So I was really disappointed with that. But then I started realizing there, it's the same thing as not trying to become an astronaut. It's it's not going to be that easy. And as I've learned from other people, really successful people in Hollywood, they get turned down all the time. One of my uh, one of my uh, friends in Hollywood said that when people are looking at your script or your proposal, whatever it might be, they're only going to get fired when they say yes, which is an interesting way to look at it. Is that as mm. long as they say no, they keep their job. But as soon as they say yes and take that risk. Then if they're putting themselves at risk if the show doesn't pan out, right? They're getting, you know, they can get they can get canned for that. So um, that's the way it is, and it's not just that way for the, you know, the group of people I was working with. It's that way for anyone trying to to do something like that. There are lots of people with good, great ideas for television, and not all of them are going to get picked. So what I, I, you know, we're still trying to give you the update on that. No, we don't have anything. We we've tried, you know, we're trying to reattack and rewrite it, and sometimes a little bit of time has to go by, you know, be, so so. You, know, you can try to reattack because that's going back four years ago when we were when we were doing that that first attempt, and we've had a few. Did you since. do you ever get feedback like why they? I mean, they probably don't really get feedback why why it didn't pass because there's no incentive for them to give that feedback. But uh, I'm sure there's a lot of funny things about being an ex astronaut that you know you could play around with. I thought it was a great script, and and Bill Prady was happy with it too. I mean, everyone was happy with it except the, not that they weren't happy with it. I just think that uh, the, the 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 network this is. I, I just think that they have lots of choices, and they went maybe they went with somebody else, or they didn't go with anybody. I don't know what happened, but no, we did not get. That's that was the interesting thing about it is they just more or less passed, you know, it, and and it didn't. It wasn't like well, we need this or that, or we'll work with you. It was a pass, and it wasn't so, much explanation. You know, it was four years ago, so I'm going to give a gut. Re go, knowing what was going on then, I'm going to give a gut reason why I think right. somebody might pass is that the TV show Space Force was not doing that great. Could be. And, and with Steve, and he had all the big names on mm -hmm. it and it just didn't seem to be working out. And maybe that was, they feel like, oh, okay, that's related to astronauts in space mm -hmm. and it's not quite doing it. And because they tend to make decisions like that, that it makes no sense, but that's a type of decision I could see people making in Hollywood. Yeah, I, I, it, it, it might, there's all kinds of reasons. You know, the climate isn't good for this or that or whatever it is like you're saying. Uh, there's whatever the reason was, um, that's where it was. And I, I, I think it's, it's you have to just keep trying and, um, may, you know, change things and, and see what people. Uh, but I, I think at some point, too, you need to stay true to yourself and, to, to change yeah. it for, you know, whatever they look, I don't think that would work. What, what I, what I enjoyed about the project most was hanging around with these guys was hanging around with Bill and, uh, and Dan and, and Jamie and, and just throwing around ideas about what the show would be. These were, these were hilarious people. These are some of the funniest people I've ever been around and they were delightful people and very good friends. And I just enjoyed working with them. And so for that reason, I would like to try to do a show and I, you know, and not, I would be nice to get, and for me, I want to tell this, this story, some of the stories we've talked about and, and the experiences I've had, I think a, a, a television show is, would be a great way to tell the audience, uh, what that all was like and make them laugh too. Cause there's a lot of funny stuff in there. We'll keep trying. One thing in the book that was kind of stood out as, as funny. And I didn't even think of this until I read it in your book. I think you were, you were talking to Charlie Duke about something about being on the moon. And he, yeah. he said, you know, the big great thing about being on the moon was that you could take a dump. That was John Young. <laughs> and it didn't, oh, John <laughs> yeah, Young. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It didn't occur to me that, yeah, the moon's got gravity. Yeah. So 
you, you solve a problem. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't believe it when he when he told me that. You know, I was uh, I was a newer astronaut, and he was so he was in his late sixties, I think, at this point, but still an active <laughs> astronaut, flying in a T thirty eight, and uh, so I was like, I can get to fly in a jet with this guy who walked on the moon, the first commander of the space shuttle. The guy was on Gemini one. You know, this is this is it. You know, I, I this is my one of my boyhood heroes, and he went to the moon twice. On Apollo 10, he orbited, and then Apollo 16, he walked on the moon. He was just, this is it, you know, the most, probably the most accomplished astronaut ever. And, uh, and it's like, you know, I'd love to fly with you. He's like, you bet, good buddy. And next thing you know, like next week, I'm in the air with him going out to California. And on our way back, as you say, I, I finally got up. He was telling me all these unbelievable stories about things that they went through as new astronauts and those other, the guys he worked with and what it was like in mission control and so and then in the White House stories, I was new. I couldn't believe all this st stuff was he was telling me. And then I finally got up to courage to ask him, what was it like on the moon? And I was expecting, I don't know what I was expecting, but it was, you know, we were coming over New Mexico or something on our way back to Houston and the sun was going down. It was like that magical time and we're up above the clouds. And it was just beautiful, you know, and, and uh, he said, what was it like on the moon, John? And he says, well, I tell you, Mike, the best thing about it is you finally could take a dump. So I, that, I did not expect to hear that, but... You know, he went on to say, well, you know, you haven't been in space yet, but you're floating around in zero gravity and you can't, you know, your gravity can't help you digest. And finally you get on the moon and at one six gravity is just enough so you can let it go. And I was like, really? I didn't have no idea what to say to that. But I think in some ways it was like trying to just make everything seem sort of normal because I can't think of anything more extraordinary than going to the moon. And uh, that certainly wasn't, I'm sure there wasn't the most most important thing, but in some way, um, you know, there was, it, it sort of made me realize, you know, all the stuff, not that it's routine, but it's achievable. And it's, you know, that's it, in some ways it kind of took the edge off of a, a huge accomplishment kind of put in very, very simple terms of what he, what he was grateful for when he finally got to the moon. I wonder if that was part of the space program's research before anybody went to the moon, or I wonder if they only realized that this is an issue or an interesting thing after they went, send people to the moon. I, th I don't think it was a concern. I, I, I don't know. I think that uh, we've learned more and more uh, with using your digestive tract and zero gravity as time. Just in the difference between my two flights, uh, we, we started taking supplements and doing other things to, uh, to help us with that stuff. So we could have a, you know, to help our, uh, help us stay regular, let's, let's say. So I, I, I don't think they knew how, what, you know, what that was going to be like and how much of an issue that was going to be. They started uh, adding to the diet and other, doing other things to help, help with that, <laughs> help, help you stay on yeah. a regular schedule. Yeah. For the people who had extended stays, like in the space station, mm -hmm. did they have issues? <laughs> well, you try to get. And now that we're on this topic, you try to get regular beforehand, right? So what it is is uh -huh. that we would start taking a, like something like Metamucil beforehand just to try to get on a regular schedule. And you keep taking that stuff uh, in quarantine and in flight just so to kind of help things move along. We also would eat a lot of dried fruit in space. You didn't have much fresh fruit. They can get some now. They have some refrigeration on the space station. But you know, these are the, you know, it sounds silly maybe in some ways, but these are the things that, you, you don't want things like that to affect your performance. You don't want to have a yeah. bad stomach or be dehydrated or sick or anything like that when you're trying to do things that are really important in space. So you have to pay attention to all those little details. Now, this is just kind of a curiosity mm -hmm. thing, but like Michael Collins, you mentioned him earlier. Mm -hmm. Why did they ever let that guy go back to the moon just so he could walk on it? Like the, yeah. he's in the first three people to go there in that, in that, you know, yeah. Apollo 11 I always felt like maybe they should have just let him go back so he could walk too on the moon. That's a, uh, you know, that's a really interesting, um, comment. I don't know if he, if he talks about that in his book, it's been, I have, I just, I just was reading his parts of his book again, which I loved carrying the fire. And I don't, I don't oh, know I if he goes that. through that decision process or he talks about that. I don't, I don't know. I, I think, um, I, 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 I don't know. I, it could be, it could be a couple of things. I think they come to mind, and I'm just you know, just just conjecture here is that um, once you have a flight like that, like Apollo 11, nothing's going to top Apollo 11. Um, nothing ever will, I don't think, in the space program until we until we find aliens walking around someplace. I, I don't think even going to Mars, I don't think is going to top Apollo 11. I think we're going to land on Mars, and people are going to say, "Wait a minute, I thought we already did that." There was that movie, you know. So I, I think. Right. 
that Apollo 11 was such an unbelievable accomplishment. I mean, maybe going to Mars will, will, will be close, but I don't know. It was really amazing when, when the whole world was paying attention to that event. So it could be part of that, that, you know, how do you, how do you top this? But, but you could argue Alan Shepard was, you know, first man in space, first mm-hmm. American in space, and then was Apollo 17. He played golf on the moon. Apollo, uh, Apollo 14. Yeah, he went 14. back. So he had a break in the action, you know. But but if you look at, like, John Glenn, for example, we were, it was 25 years ago today, John Glenn, yesterday, not the date where we're talking about, but it was 25 years ago, John Glenn went back to space. After 36 years after his first flight, and the reason was is that he was an American hero. And uh, mm-hmm. John F. Kennedy was the president during John Glenn's first flight. Said, well, "You're not flying again because it's a bit dangerous, and we're not putting we're not putting you at risk as this." Because John Glenn reached this this fame of, oh, he was very more famous than Alan Shepard. He was the first American in the orbit, and even though Alan Shepard was the first guy in space, I think as far as the fame factor went, John Glenn was was a was more famous at the time, more yeah. more well known than Alan Shepard. And so uh, that restriction was kind of put on by John F. Kennedy. And then unfortunately we lost uh, President Kennedy. And there's a li- there was a, an interesting press conference before John Glenn was, was put on the, that second mission where President Clinton was president at the time. And he said something like, it's okay for John Glenn to fly in space again, which was kind of, it kind of went under the radar at the time, but it made the NASA news that now, okay, another president said it's okay for you to go. And then he was, then he flew again on that second flight. I don't know if that had anything to do with Michael Collins or any of those guys, because yeah, they didn't fly, they didn't fly a second time. Um, you know, there, there were, there were guys like, uh, like Buzz who went to the moon. I'm sorry, like, uh, uh, mentioned, uh, John Young went to the moon twice and yeah. Jim Lovell also did. He, he flew around it on Apollo eight and he was a commander of Apollo 13. Didn't get to walk on it, but he was there two times. So, yeah, you would think Michael Collins would have been perfect for a command on an, a following uh, uh, Apollo mission and to, to do the landing and and to walk around. Um, I'm not I'm not sure why that didn't happen, but um, so you no. Know, so what do you think is next for enough. the space program? Like now mm-hmm. that you know space tourism is becoming a thing, so now becoming going into space might get commoditized at some point in the next 10, 20 years. It's already starting to be oh, with yeah. space tourism, and then of course. There's talk of going to the moon again. There's talk of Mars, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, co- co- you know, going into space, sending rockets into space has become much more commercial yep. and, and in the private sector. So what's where do, you, where do you think this is going? I think overall it's headed in a, in a very good direction. I think having private enterprise involved is really good. I think the advances in technology and AI and, and computing – automation where now the spaceships are or very automated compared to everything we had through the shuttle the shuttle was manually flown and very difficult and dangerous and you had to know lots of stuff not only what you were going to do but also all the emergencies 99.9 percent of the training that the pilots had for the space shuttle was never used uh, on orbit because it was all to handle emergencies that never happened so now we have ai and computing and automation to handle all that which makes the training a lot easier and more people can go and even my students at Columbia have flown twice. They've flown experiments in space twice, which would be unheard yeah. of just a few years ago. So I think overall it's opened up lots of opportunities um, for not just uh, for commercial benefit and not just for for people to go to space, but also for science and access to space is, has increased and is, will continue as more and more commercial entities get involved. It's not just governments anymore. So I think that's overall a good thing. Um, the only thing that I, I worry about, and this is just me personally, I typically don't talk about this, but I think there was something cool about being a NASA astronaut, you know, doing it as a career and being part of that team that I try to express in the book and when I talk to people, that I hope we don't lose that. You know, that that is still, I think, you know, um, something to aspire to, to, to do that job as a career, to serve your country in that way, to try to do it on behalf of science, you know, we weren't there doing it for any financial gain. We were government employees trying to trying to do what we thought was important. And as a result, it led to, I think, the accomplishment of great things and uh, and also a lot of great experiences and things that I try to share. And so I, I don't think we're going to lose that. I think there'll always be that the NASA part of it, the, the role of the government in there to do that. Um, but I think supplementing that with what we're doing with commercial space flying 
whether it's commercial astronauts or companies doing things in space, I, I think that that far outweighs uh, any negative that I can think of. So I'm very excited and it, 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 about the future. And it enables NASA to do other things like what we're learning with the James Webb t t Space Telescope, going back to the moon again with the Space Launch System and the crew that's been announced to, to do that, um, looking at asteroids, the asteroid return missions and, and putting our attention to things. Uh, NASA has been freed up to do a lot of that now because the commercial enterprise is taking care of what's going on in low earth orbit and may also be taking care of going back to the moon. So we'll see how that works out. And, and I think you're right. I don't think that team aspect, particularly kind of the aura around that from the early decades of NASA, including when you were there, I don't think that ever goes away because you guys were not only going into space, but you were exploring a frontier that America and the world and technology had, which is how do we do this? And it's pretty scary. Mm -hmm. And some people are going to lose their lives. So you have to be good and excellent and work together and continuous improvement and, and all these good things. So, and you really exemplified that both in your career and then now post career, like, you know, bunch of books and uh you're 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 teaching you're 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 trying different things you're 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 again an, an inspiration to many people not every astronaut is is you know I'm, I'm not criticizing anybody else but you know you're making an effort to really kind of show what happened and and what you went through and your ups and downs and you know how hard it was and what you had to, to do to achieve the impossible and it's it's an inspiration like that's that's something to keep in mind about not just about giving up, but about improving yourself to fit the role you wanna you wanna ultimately have, and the teamwork that's required, and the leadership that's required, and so on. So, again, great book, Moonshot, <laughs> Mike. You're always welcome. Keep writing books and making TV shows, and come back all the time. And uh, uh, I'm sure you have many great things to accomplish in in the next phase of your career. And uh, uh, thanks once again. Thank you. Thank you, James. I, I really enjoy speaking with you and, uh, you got me thinking, uh, with some of the oh, questions you're asking. That's my goal. So I hope your audience <laughs> enjoys this and, and, uh, I really appreciate your support and, uh, hope to speak to you again soon. Thanks, James. Definitely. Thank you. Diving deep into your passions has never been easier. Thanks to Amazon Prime. You get all-in-one access to the things you need so you can get more out of the things you love. With a range of services including Prime Video, Amazon Music, and Prime Fast free shipping. Amazon Prime is like your personal mission control for all the things that inspire. From shopping and streaming to saving, it's on Prime. Visit Amazon.com slash Prime to get more out of whatever you're into. It's on Prime. Did you know that franchise owners are more likely to start a successful business than entrepreneurs who go it alone? Neighborly offers 19 premier brands with services that repair, maintain, and enhance homes. With Neighborly, you'll get the business model, marketing resources, and corporate support you need to pursue a rewarding future. Learn more about joining over 5,000 Neighborly franchises by downloading your free guide at go.nbly.com podcast.